then. <laughs> Hi, we're the Sea Knights from Tempe Prep Academy, and our team consists of eight juniors and like three mentors that we really like. So today we're just going to tell you about how we designed and constructed one ROV and then redesigned it about 20 times. So what we started off is we had a late start after the first season. We were looking for a new challenge. So we actually decided to enter the underwater robotics competition. So we knew we had not very much time and it was our first time. So we decided to go with as simple as we possibly could make it and have it still work. So we did a bunch of research online and we looked at the past technical reports and we actually use those resources quite a bit and a lot of our designs aren't actually our own. We just modified them slightly to make them fit this year's task. So we also incorporated computer automated design and we researched and down selected and then we built it, tested it and then redesigned it about 20, maybe 30 times. So once we finally got to our last redesign, we ended up just going to the mode where we found a problem quickly brainstormed solutions and then fixed it. So we just reduced the functionality and we went with as simple as possible, hopefully it works. So we had to use materials that were available locally at night that were probably in somebody's backyard at the time. So we just built it, tested it, and simplified it. So this was what we originally built. This was Onera Hephaestu, or Dream of Hephaestus. And Hephaestus is the carpenter god in Greek mythology. So SOLIDWORKS main role during this design process, since we already had most of the parts, was to just place it on the frame and move it around so nothing would bump into each other. We also used, uh, we also made a cone to represent our field of view and we placed it on the camera to help us figure out what angle we should mount it at. This is the frame of our ROV. We have this bottom square here to mount our, our onboard electronics. Um, we also have this part to mount ballast tanks and uh, anything that would give it buoyancy. Uh, we have these holes, as you can see, all around the robot. They were so if the robot had some kind of leak, it wouldn't really affect the buoyancy of it and would keep it neutrally buoyant. We have this arm right here because our original plan was to go with a mechanical arm. And we, uh, so we put that in the base. We have these sled like base here, as you can see on the robot. So if so, if we mounted the laser here, like we did on the robot, it would be easy to land it at the bottom of the pool and be able to uh, shine it at the buoy and. So for our propulsion, we had we reused some bilge pump motors, like we took off the things that were originally on it and replaced them with our propellers. And we also used the things that mounted them onto the thing for our shrouds to protect us from putting our fingers into the propellers, which would have been bad. We also had adjustable mounts so that they would pro that they would <laughs> that they would propel uh, that they would shoot through the center of gravity so that the thing would not tilt in the water. Um, uh, so lights and camera, um, we, we went through uh, two phases with the lights. So we originally started off with these um, basically just LED lights that were um, uh, basically glued onto this uh, aluminum rod. And um, it was originally hooked up to the circuit board so that um, from the controller side we can basically just turn on and off the lights um, when, we're, when we're underwater. But when, um, spoiler alert, um, our circuit board uh, got flooded, um, we had to eventually ditch the idea and use um, just uh, portable lights, as you see, you can see here on the front, that are just, um, you basically just turn them on before putting them in the water, and then they just stay on. And um, although they're not waterproof, they do stay on for over an hour. So that was one of the advantages of these. And for our camera, um, as you can see, uh, this is a, a sample of, from our back camera, um, if you guys want to hold it or look it up. We basically used a, um, uh, the GoPro um, case cameras and um, basically took, our, took out the camera inside and then used our own digital camera inside to, um, so that we 
you'd have a case that's waterproof and some something we can mount it on, and so something easily to mount on. And um, again, when when our circuit board got flooded, we we had to resort to only using one camera. So we decided to instead try to just use the front camera. Because the other camera got damaged. Well, well, because um, since our okay, the reason why we went to the front camera is because. Um, we only had enough lines to go, um, we only had enough um, Cat5 lines to um, hook up to one camera, and so we decided to go with the front camera because, because we can view, and, yeah, to view the front, and, yeah. Oh, um, also not here is, um, we had a, our torpedo system um, consisted of basically a, originally consisted of basically a solenoid um, hooked up here and um, it basically was originally spring-loaded and had basically an aluminum, a, a aluminum rod but when we tested it in the water the rod, it seemed on land it would go pretty far but when we tested it in the water it just went straight and then just floated backwards so we didn't really get any displacement on, on that so what we reverted to was using basically uh, a toy, basically a water toy, and um, hooked it up to a basically a PVC pipe, and um, what is it? We still use um, a little bit of the spring and set it onto here, and then when the solenoid would um, lift lift this up, um, we would have this uh, torpedo continually on, and um, and it would uh, eventually float to the top and eventually cross cross the line. Now, again, when our circuit board uh, got flooded, we, we, we ditched the idea of using a solenoid because um, that, took, that was too much of a draw power and um, we didn't have enough wires. So, so what we did was we designed a, just a, a physical trigger in which um, when, when, it, uh, when the ROV touched the bottom of the pool, this, this trigger would lift up and the, uh, the torpedo would then be lifted off as opposed to being triggered by a solenoid. So the pressure sensor was actually originally mounted to the circuit board on our robot, which was actually in here. And since this pressure sensor is actually built for air, we attached a nice tube to it so that we could just so that the air would protect the pressure sensor because when the water pressure increased, the water would just travel up the tube. So, and one of the other benefits of this is that we could attach this at any height on the ROV that we wanted to. So that once we figured out the point that we wanted to line up our ROV with, we wouldn't have to make any software fixes in our depth calculations. We could simply adjust the height of the tube. And a similar thing problem happened with our temperature sensor and hydrophone that happened with the rest of the ROV. So we had actually originally mounted our pressure sensor or our temperature sensor and our hydrophone to this metal rod protruding from it so that we could simultaneously perform both tasks. We, to protect the hydrophone and for allow easy mounting, we, all, we actually surrounded it in PVC pipe and just had a ring clamp on here. However, once our circuit board, spoiler alert, flooded, we had to revert back. And we, this temperature sensor actually won't function. Its cord is cut. It's simply on here because we didn't actually have, get time to take it off. But so we were, but it would originally just sent a signal back to our circuit board and then back to our control station where both of them would have been changed into the appropriate signal. So uh, our homing device was basically a simple, simple clam design um, using a uh, plastic box that had an, well, has an electromagnet and a washer so that it can hook on, and the spring here so that um, so that it can open when the electromagnet turns off. And yeah, this is basic, just a basic design. Um, try to keep it simple as much as possible. Okay, we went through. Um, two stages of the laser. Originally we had a um, basically just a, a, a normal laser pointer. Uh, we took it apart and uh, sealed it in this basically sort of like brass, brass tubing. And so um, 
and so it would just go straight to the uh, circuit board and and um, turn on whenever um, on on land, but whenever we just wanted to turn it on. But the problem was is that supposedly water. We concluded that water must have gotten in here and um, shorted the wires. So um, we found out later when we put our voltmeter <coughs> on it that it actually turned into a battery. So we had to. <laughs> We basically had to cut, cut our ends on this one. And um, like the lights, our current laser um, is basically just turn it turn it on and just put it in the water. And um, it's in this um, water sealed uh, t uh, case. And basically it's just like our lights. It's, it's not powered by our, um, by our battery or anything. It's just powered by itself and it's um, always on. We went with this dumb hook, as you can see on the left side of our robot, uh, instead of going with the original plan of a mechanical arm, because it was simple. We needed to make the robot as simple as possible. Um, we also we didn't have enough Cat5 cables to draw any, to give the mechanical arm any power, and this works just as well as the mechanical. Arm. So, if you ask an underwater robotics team what their biggest problem is, they'll probably give you the answer of waterproofing. I'm going to give you the same answer. The first thing we tried to do was coat the circuit board in wax. So we poured hot wax into the circuit board, we let it dry, we put it on the robot, everything worked. We put it underwater, drove for a little bit, pulled it out, and it turns out that the circuit board gets hot and when wax gets hot, it melts. So, our wax melted, water got in, and our circuit board fried. So, we took it out, we melted the wax back off, and we decided that we would try again, because the electronics somehow still worked. So, we, went, we asked some experts for advice on waterproofing, and we received a couple of options. One of them was to put it in a plexiglass case, and the other one was to pot it in epoxy. The problem with the plexiglass case was that we thought, since we have so many wires coming out from our circuit board, it might be a bit difficult to get each and every one of these through a hole in the plexiglass case. So, we decided that we would just coat it in the epoxy and see if that would work. So, it worked when it dried. We put it on the robot, it was able to dry for a little bit. But, once again, the culprit of heat destroyed the board. There was a crack in the epoxy and water got in. So, after the epoxy was cracked and our circuit board was fried once again, we decided that we would have to find some other solution. The first thing we did was, we were desperate and we tried to take the epoxy off, but as you can see, <laughs> that didn't work very well. So up here on the left side, we have our off-board electronics when we were still using the circuit board. It's just basically the microprocessor, a power distribution board. a module that would take analog and digital inputs, and then the circuit board. And then afterwards, we decided that we would have to, we would send the speed controller signal straight through the Cat5. So we had to put the speed controllers off the robot. So here we've attached the speed controllers. We sent the signal straight through the Cat5 cable. And you can see on the left that we have many different purposes for all our Cat5 cables. We have eight wires in each Cat5. So, initially we were able to control direction, speed, torpedo, lights, laser, everything. And now, on our new tether, we gave five of the wires each to each bilge pump. We reduced our number of bilge pumps to three. We gave it seven grounds and then two wires for the camera signals. This worked initially, except with such small wires it pulled too much and some of the wires started fusing and then that caused one of the jaguars to overheat 